you have to think about the fact that not everyone in the world is going to see constellations the same way. Or if you're on drugs, that you'll see them or differently. Or if you're on yes, drugs, okay. yeah. Not everybody or, you know, if you're... sees <laughs> drugs. I'm certain that the Greeks were on something for half the constellations that they named. Oh my God, they must have they been. Must they must have been. This is Star Talk, Cosmic Queries Edition, ever popular with all of our audiences. And I got with me my co host today, Matt Kirschen. Matt, welcome back to Star Talk. Thanks, Neil. It's good to see you. So, Matt, you're a host of Probably Science. I was a one time yes. guest on there. And Absolutely. You call me. I'm waiting for you. To I, I will. I, yeah, I'd love you to come back. We, we, all right. Still one of our most popular episodes. <laughs> okay. So, today, our topic is like folklore in astrophysics it's like and how do they relate and who connects a line between modern or even ancient astrophysics and cultures and folklore this is like there aren't many people who do this and when you think about it you know the sky was really accessible to everyone at all times forever Right? I mean, unless it was cloudy. But cave <laughs> cave dwellers saw the night sky. So of all the sciences, uh, modern astronomy and, of course, astrophysics uh, would have connections that maybe other sciences don't. So if anyone is going to tackle this, it's going to be on Star Talk, And we have an expert in this in the name of Moya McTeer. Moya, welcome to Star Talk. Hi, Neil. Thanks for having me. This is... A goal of mine. It has been for a long time. Oh my I'm, gosh. Really, well, thank you. I'm really happy to be here. <laughs> thank you. So you're an astrophysicist, a folklorist, mm -hmm. and a mm -hmm. communicator. I love that, that that can be a title today because it's so necessary to move Absolutely. information and knowledge and wisdom from one place to another that requires communicators. And so you, you have your own podcast. Podcasts. Oh, excuse <laughs> me. <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, podcasts. <laughs> Tell me their names. Uh, so the one that is my my favorite brain baby, probably just because it's oldest, is called Exolore. Um, it's a portmanteau, actually, of exoplanets and folklore, because the whole shtick of the show is building fictional worlds based on facts and science. Um, usually that means I start with some astronomical difference, like what if this planet didn't orbit a star? And we know that those types of planets exist. They're called rogue planets. There are probably tens of thousands of them out there. Um, or what if a planet had two suns? Or what if it got hit with asteroids all the time? And then we just imagine the consequences of that difference. Um, my other podcast is more straightforward, more obviously about science, and it's called Pale Blue Pod. It's actually quite new. It just launched in November, and it's a show for uh, people November who 2020. are... Two, yeah. Uh -huh. Of 2022, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's it's a little baby. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> um, it is a show for people who are overwhelmed by the universe but still want to be its friend. And I have I've taken some notes <laughs> on your your show and the way that you do things. I have a comedian co-host. Her name is Corinne Caputo. She's very funny, very smart. Nice. Uh, but the whole vibe of the show is extremely cozy. We want to make space feel very warm and familiar for people. Oh, so, so the microphones are close to say, welcome to Pale Blue Pod. <laughs> is that, is that what we doing? get very Hello. ASMR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love ASMR. Yeah, so both okay. of you just then, like there are some listeners who got properly tingly right then. And <laughs> you're welcome. Well, you're welcome. Oh, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. This is the universe. Yes. I, I love it. I love it. So tell us about your, your, this, this strand, this thread that, multiple threads that you've woven to connect astrophysics, which was one half of your major in college, to mm -hmm. folklore. Yeah, let me let me tell you a bit about how I came to major in both of those things because um, you you might know this Neil having gone to Harvard yourself, but you there's a pre-approved list of double majors at Harvard and they're they're normal things like government and econ or psychology and computer science. Surprisingly, astrophysics and folklore mythology not on that list of stuff that Harvard administrators thought people would want to study together. So I actually had to do some negotiating and go to the heads of both departments, which are very small. They're two of the smallest departments at Harvard. And I said, 
you can't afford to lose bodies. <laughs> let me study both of you and then everyone wins. So they did. Uh, they did let me study both of them, but only after I gave a list of potential thesis topics that I could write. Because when you do a double major at Harvard, you have to write a thesis that sits at the intersection of your two fields. Um, what I ended up doing was writing a science fiction novel that was set on a real exoplanet that I studied. Um, I characterized <laughs> it with data with data from Kepler, and I the Kepler mission to find exoplanets. Right. So we yes, had a very good yeah. data set there. Yeah. I had well, it was K two, so the data was a bit noisier than mm -hmm. from the Kepler primary mission, but the plot of the novel was kind of an allegory or. Um, like a parallel to the Hawaiian sovereignty movement. I got to go to Hawaii. I talked to the protectors, the people demonstrating on Mauna Kea when the 30 meter telescope conflict was happening. Um, and that was a really fun project. But I, it's taken me many years. Wait, to you were in the middle exact... of total cultural turbulence and it was a fun yes. project for you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay. I, I like talking to people. I like hearing their sides Yeah, just to things. catch some people up on that. So uh, the largest, the plans to build the largest telescope in the world in the best observing site of the world, which mm -hmm. is in the big island of Hawaii, uh, met resistance from uh, indigenous communities who uh, viewed the mountain as, as sacred in a way that would, should not allow this kind of construction. And so it was very, it's fascinating cultural, political confrontations that unfolded. And you just drop yourself in the middle of it. Damn. Well, I mean, when I was a senior in college was when it was really frothing. You know, yeah. that conflict was extremely in the news, at least for the astronomy community. Uh, so you wrote a you wrote a novel, interesting, as as in in as a in, pl in place of, but that was your thesis, the novel. That it was my thesis, yeah. I, I had the creative part, and then I also had an appendix with all of my research notes. That's a brilliant, a brilliant to it. way to, to stitch those two together. Uh, uh, Thank you great. so much. But you have not, <laughs> was that published? No, I, it's, it's in a Google Drive somewhere up on my website. No, somebody's got to make a movie out of that. Wait. I mean, I'm calling I'd all Hollywood. So <laughs> Call, okay. If anyone wants to approach me for TV or movie rights to Lying <laughs> Hordes, please, please let me know. Yes, definitely. <laughs> we'll make that happen. And you have another yeah. book? I do, yeah. That this book, you just out of my control, most you know. Latest, but I, you know what, Neil, I like to stay busy. <laughs> okay, all right, go on. Um, this latest book is called "The Milky Way: An Autobiography of Our Galaxy." Please pay close attention to that word "autobiography" because this entire book is written from the point of view of our Milky Way galaxy. Um, it tells <laughs> its story from its birth to you know what might happen when the universe ends. It talks about its life, um, its adolescence, and how it feels to make stars. It talks about the the galactic neighbors that it has. Wait a minute, how about the collision which... with Andromeda? What does that feel like? Tell me. Um, so in in Did the you book, like it? <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> well, it has it hasn't happened yet. So the Milky Way is. Oh, is it's only going, an autobiography up to today. Up to today, yeah. Oh. Um, How does it feel so the Milky about, Way looks about forward to merge to with Andromeda? How does it feel about that? Oh, it is quite excited. Um, <laughs> so in, in the book, I I frame galactic mergers as like romance almost oh. or or you know like interpersonal relationships and so there are minor mergers and major mergers minor mergers happen between galaxies where one is much more massive than the other yeah. and so i so what, i think it's of those as little flings wait 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 so we those who study this call that galactic cannibalism when mm -hmm. a big galaxy eats a little one but you're calling them romances that's that's okay, such a different well, take on the situation you know, <laughs> you know what neil why do the two have to be mutually exclusive like some sometimes <laughs> the galaxies are eating each other oh. and at the same time it's romantic so like okay. whatever all right that sounds a little <laughs> and creepy, that happens to be in sex world sometimes <laughs> sometimes the female eats the male afterwards you know it's like yeah yeah that's like, true galaxies so. are just praying mantises Ooh, um, yeah, it bites but the head but off. no the uh, the merger the eventual merger between andromeda and the milky way will be a major merger because their masses are much more similar and that's more like a marriage um so for billions of years the milky way and andromeda have had this long-term courtship yes. they've been sending love notes back and forth to each other in the form of hypervelocity stars where they encode their messages into the spectra of the stars and it's very nerdy and very cute wow wow okay so this just came out in 2021 is that correct 
2022, just a few months ago. Oh, oh, this came out, oh, mid-2022, just just to emerge from COVID. Very Mm -hmm. nice. Okay. So we'll look for that. Damn. Damn. (laughs) Okay. It's a good story. It's very sassy. I, I feel like I should prime people. The Milky Way has a healthy ego. And uh, <laughs> some might say it's a little condescending to us humans, but like who who wouldn't be? Who Look wouldn't at us. be? We're Every so alien tiny. would be condescending. Yeah, it's exactly. clearly the case. Clearly. Yeah. And one last question. So we got your astrophysics, we got your folklore, and uh, what about your science communication, science education part? Um, what what do you think is missing that you can bring to it? Ooh, I think the folklore connections that I can help people make are really important um, because. I, I know that people will feel better about learning science if they can connect to it personally. And one of the strongest personal connections yeah. or mm-hmm. col- yeah, culturally or, or personally, I was, I was getting there. Like the, the cultural connection is a great way to make it feel more personal. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. People might grow up hearing stories and legends and myths from their from their grandparents, from their uh, from their elders. And if you can learn about science and tuck it into what you've already heard from your people, then it, it makes it a lot more um, a lot more familiar. Got it. Got it. So that's a gap that needs filling. Very good. Yeah, I think there so. Yeah, t- and there- I'm not I'm not a comedian like Matt, but I think that sometimes I can make people laugh, <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. and so I try to bring that into my psychom too. There's been some movement within planetariums to do that, especially in planetariums that have access to indigenous communities in the yeah. Southwest, in Australia. If you go to Australian planetariums, there's a Aboriginal uh, storytelling that's often folded in to. Um, to the show so and they have such beautiful stories i mean they they have cave paintings and cultural evidence mm-hmm. and and like oral storytelling that talks about astronomy going back like sixty thousand years yeah it's in fact, a really yeah old knowledge base. there's a book called dark emu do you know about that dark emu? oh i haven't heard about the book but i do know about the emu constellation yeah so the emu the dark emu so matt i hope you know about this the in the sky the, the Western cultures typically describe what they see based on the existence of a star and a pattern or sources uh-huh. of light. But if you look at the dark lanes within our own galaxy, the Milky Way across the sky, there's a stretch of darkness that looks like an emu. <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. so so it's the absence of light. Oh, so that they, gives they you go the by sh- the neg- the shape of the negative space rather than the, the shape spe- of the shape of the negative they space. Have, they have both, but but yeah, as, that particular as the design, constellation as a design is person space. would say, yeah, negative space uh, thing up there. The look of the stars, because you know, like you say, it was the thing that was accessible always, but in, more accessible then than it was now. Because I I grew up in London. We were talking about this just before the show, and you both live in New York now. And if you look up. You don't see much in the way of stars uh, on account yeah. of all the light, but the first. That's few why times we have that a be- planetarium. Okay. Exactly. The first few, <laughs> yeah, you have to build. You have to artificially build it in a building inside the city. But Correct. The first few times I've been somewhere, like you know, I've been to like a, a mountainous place or or a desert, or so someone that's really in the middle of nowhere, and then suddenly looked up on a clear night and just gone, oh. Now I get mm-hmm. why they were always writing poems and and yes. songs and like this is. Mm-hmm suddenly this blanket of stars that looks truly because when i when i grew up it's like oh yeah there's a star there's another star there's another star and then you go somewhere that's properly remote mm-hmm. like it would have been everywhere thousands of years right, you're ago. not assaulted and by the sky it's just kind it's of suddenly <laughs> yeah it, it, it is right. a, it's absurd it's this this thing that appears after nightfall is ridiculous Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's I, I think the number the last number I saw was that 80 percent of the sky is affected by light and air pollution now. So 80 percent of people around the world are not seeing the same sky that our ancestors saw. And that that makes me really sad because I think that makes people lose a big point of connection that we could have with the universe. A cosmic connection. Well, mm-hmm. this is supposed to be cosmic queries. And so but I delighted in learning everything about you there. Moya, so that when the questions come in, well, that, I mean, people were cued that you were going to be our guest and with that expertise. So, Matt, uh, load up the questions and we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to dive right in to Moya McTeer's expertise, astrophysics and folklore, when Star Talk returns. We're back, Star Talk Cosmic Queries. We're talking about astrophysics and folklore with Moya McTeer, who studied both in college and professionally and she is now a freelance 
uh, podcaster and communicator, author of a book, The Milky Way, an autobiography of our galaxy, written by the Milky Way itself, because because Matt, she's the Milky Way whisperer, right? She's yes. <laughs> I love the Moya idea. That... knows what the Milky Way feels. And, I do. And actually, I mean, if you uh, if you look at the title page, it doesn't say by Moya McTeer. It just says via. I merely channel. That's right. You were just you just channeling it. Perfect. Perfect. The Milky it's Way. Great when publishers it's... can go along with that. With that. Yeah. Um, the book premise. written by the Milky Way with its galaxy-sized brain. There right. you go. <laughs> there you go. So let, let's bring. We're Cosmic Queries, Matt, from our Patreon supporters. Yeah. Uh, well, this the, the questions are. This is again because of the subject matter. Uh, the questions are all over the place. There's some straight astronomy questions and there's some folklore <laughs> questions i'm going to start with this one because it ties into what we were talking about just before the end of the first segment Stephen mm -hmm. murphy from atlanta says constellations have always been a good way to identify where stars are but they are hard to remember and teach in the modern world when few know latin and mythology can ursa major just be the big bear would you make the archer <laughs> hawkeye instead of sagittarius it would take some getting used to but so did pluto not being a planet Oh, I love it. I love it. Oh, wow. So, so, so uh, Moya, I, I'm going to rephrase that question to ask you, why don't we just update all the constellations to, to modern uh, mythologies or modern things we care about? <clears throat> have, that's a great question. Yeah, have, like, You're going to have to... Uh, there's some con there's, I've checked this because I like ice cream. There's some that looks like an ice cream cone. And so we <laughs> have Conus Major and Conus Minor, for example, or have like the smartphone. <laughs> for any yeah. rectangle that's up there. So what do you say about uh, why are we so anchored to what people were thinking 2,000 years ago? Why did it make it relevant to today? Oh, God, there's so much here. Um, so first of all, if you want to start renaming the constellations, you have to take it up with the IAU, the International Astronomical Union. They are this organization that's in charge of naming stuff officially in space. And they have designated 88 official constellations in the sky. And and I, I emphasized official there because there's a difference between constellations and asterisms to a modern astrophysicist. A constellation is the region of the sky, like the physical area uh, that we have broken up the sky into, and there are 88 of those. Asterisms are the shapes that you can make by connecting dots between the stars, and there are an infinite number of those. So you can choose to rename your constellations. You can choose to, to focus on Conus Major or Minor. <laughs> <laughs> you can make an iPhone constellation. Um, you you can just draw you know, connections you know, Samsung between whatever totally, stars you want. Samsung would get into that because they make the Samsung Galaxy. Galaxy, See? yeah, they would love that. That's like a total <laughs> sponsoring opportunity for a new <laughs> constellation drive, but go on. Yeah. But, but, I mean, you can make up your own constellations. I think that that would be a really cute, like, date idea or just, like, something to do with your friends. Go out stargazing and come up with new names and new constellations and new stories to go along with them. But the constellations that we do have, the asterisms that we mostly talk about today, come to us from Greek mythology. And so they have these 2,000 years worth of traction like they have dug themselves into our cultural memory and before that they came from babylonians um the like the crab and the the bull constellations both just pulled right from oh, the cancer mythology. and taurus yeah okay yeah yeah, yeah. 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 um so even the Greeks were using more ancient constellations and asterisms uh, than what they were making up. Mm -hmm. So I think we're just following in the grand tradition of using the names that have come before us. Uh, because it would be really difficult if everyone actually did come up with their own names. You wouldn't be able to talk about it. Oh, so you, couldn't, you, wouldn't have the shared, you wouldn't have the shared yeah. culture about exactly. that. Interesting. Because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them are... You know, the ancient Greeks called constellations katasterismoi, which meant placed by the gods. They believed that a lot of these constellations were messages intentionally put into the sky by their deities to teach us whatever we needed to know. Damn, human, like the story human of ego just knows no bounds. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. Well, I mean, think, it's, Dang. It, life was rough two and three thousand years ago it i imagine Dang. it was pretty comforting to know that if you lived a, a i don't know a heroic or at least a notable enough life that maybe the gods would put you immortalize you mm -hmm. by putting you into the sky as a constellation so, that's what happened to orion so i have a fast constellation story 
that hardly anyone knows. It's not that it's secret. It's just hardly anyone knows it. When we rebuilt the Rose Center for Earth and Space, and we got our new projector from Zeiss, and they were going to have the constellations built in that you can turn on and off whatever, whenever you're showing the night sky. We use that in addition to our digital projector that takes us anywhere in the universe. Point is, we create the 88 constellations. We hired an artist to give a modern... Um, a sensibility to the illustrations. Yes, it's still Hercules oh, nice. and it's still Orion, but it has he has a modern hand as he draws it, right? It's not these these Renaissance curly constellations mm -hmm. that you might see in old maps. Anyhow, do you know that Gemini in almost every ma a constellation illustration are shown as two infants, okay? <laughs> two babies. Because they're twins, okay? However, in Greek mythology, they were like adults, okay? They were like full-grown people. But the reason why they were always drawn as babies is because the stars, for you to fully flesh out a human being, they have to be very close to each other. And the only way you could really pull that off is by drawing babies. <laughs> but the illustrator was gay. And he said, mm. I'm drawing two full-grown men who are going to be really close to each other on the sky. <laughs> so, so in the Hayden Planetarium, our Gemini constellation are two full-grown men like with overlapping shoulders, arms around each other. And I love that so much. I'll do them too. <laughs> so, so, so this was his, his little, you know, he didn't twist history. He made it real and mm -hmm. just said, let's try to put a little wokeness into the night sky. And so that's yes. in the Hayden Planetarium's Star Theater. Um, I love that. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And one of the things we learn in folklore is that every new telling of a story, every new presentation of, of this folkloric knowledge is just as valid as what came before. It's not that you're changing. You're just, you're evolving. You're accreting, accreting yeah. new, new <laughs> insights. Yeah. Okay. So Amazing. let's. So next one, Matt. I love these. Keep them coming. All right. Well, you, since you mentioned Orion, uh, FX Flynn says, uh, Moya, I was from where? Do we week. know where they're from? Do we know I don't where know where FX, uh, okay. FX is mm -hmm. from, but um, Moya uh, says, uh, says, Moya, I was struck last week by the magnificent sight of Mars atop Orion as it lay due south. Oh, here we go. It is actually mentioned in the thing as it lo as it lay due south of my location in Vermont. So not too far, just up the road from you during the wee hours of the morning. God of War above the Hunter. I immediately wondered if this combination featured in any of the Inca histories we've collected. Uh, you know, William Sullivan's Secret of the Incas, Myth, Astronomy, and the War Against Time. Here's hoping this particular combination is only remembered for its dramatic combination of bright red, orange, and bluish white points of light and nothing else. So wow. is... I love that. So, yeah. uh, so the question I think, Moya, would be, it was Orion a hunter in other cultures? Or because... Mar and, and is mm. Mars the god of war in other cultures? That's a great question. Because juxtaposed um, on the sky, you know, that could mean war, right? I mean, mm -hmm, people, yeah, you know. yeah, the god of war over the hunter. In a lot of cultures, um, remember, not all cultures are going to place the the stars that we associate with Orion into the same constellation. Got it. Uh, so I, I know that there are there are cultures in South America where the three stars of Orion's belt are like three brothers fishing in a canoe together. Very and different. Have nothing to do with, yeah, with Orion the hunter. I mean, they're still hunting, but it's, I guess it's so. different. I, I, um, I love, sorry, side is, note, but I just, I, I, I love that in every culture still, wherever they are on growing up on completely different sides of the world independently, they've still thought to just look at the stars and go and draw pictures between them. Draw. Yeah. Like, yeah, what, yeah, are point, they, yeah. What, what patterns do they make? I mean, it was the main source of entertainment that we've had for billions. They didn't have hundreds HBO, of thousands of years. right? Yeah. They didn't have <laughs> yeah. you know streaming services. I guess the it's either. the same as looking what? at clouds, but the clouds, these clouds don't move. These clouds stay the same every night. Correct. Mm. Mm -hmm. They do. They do move. I, I mean, mean they, well, do. they they would, they would look at the differences between the the fixed and the moving stars. Actually, so the the stars oh. in Orion, those would be fixed because they're moving with each other as as a whole, um, and it does really look like the sky is spinning around the earth but then there are there are wandering stars um which is where our word planet comes from because the planets and the moon and the sun were these points of light that appeared to move relative to all of the stuff in the background oh. like mars would have been a, a wandering star um so no not every culture saw orion as a hunter although many of them 
did if they could see the Pleiades. That's that's an interesting thing because so many cultures around the world saw the Pleiades, this little cluster of seven stars, as as like seven sisters or seven I don't know swans. Like the they they associated them with very feminine qualities. And because Orion is pointing towards the Pleiades, a lot of them also said that like Orion was hunting those sisters. Wow. You have to think about the fact that not everyone in the world is going to see constellations the same way. Uh, depending on where you are, you might not be able to see constellations. But Or if uh, you're on drugs, you, that you'll see them or differently. Or if you're on yes, drugs, okay. yeah. Not everybody or, you know, if you're... <laughs> <laughs> I was, can't I was to mention certain, the drugs. I'm certain that the <laughs> yeah. Greeks were on something for half the constellations that they named. Oh, my God. They must have been. They must have been. Oh, my. People back then, I'm sure, were doing so many drugs. <laughs> That's that's my headcanon for the ancient world. Wait, wait, here's a question for you. Uh, Pegasus, a very northern constellation, for us to make a horse out of it is actually upside down. So we knowingly made an upside down constellation. I'm just wondering, in the southern hemisphere, did they, what did, how do they, they because some are upside yeah. down, right? So do they think of upside down constellations or is everything right side up to them? Um. I don't know that for for specific Southern cultures, but mm -hmm. I mean, upside down is just a matter of reference. Right. Uh, I, I can't imagine many cultures in the past would have intentionally assigned a constellation to be upside down unless they had traveled to uh, another hemisphere, so identified it as the same group of oh, stars, and then got but it. in a different yeah. orientation, mm -hmm. and then went back and was like, whoa, <laughs> they see this differently. Right, because Pegasus um, does does look, it's got some stars that resemble a horse's head. It's got that mm -hmm. angle and the, and the arc, but it is completely upside down, and Pegasus, the constellation zone, has only room for half the horse. So it's an upside down flying half a horse. Half and somebody horse. had to think that up. <laughs> I'm just saying. But, at least it's the front half. Yeah, exactly. That's the better half you know, of, of the Yeah, Pegasus. if it was the horse's ass, that's a whole other. <laughs> that's a um, different mythology yeah. right there. Totally different. <laughs> Uh, can I ask you a quick question? This this is a quick question that comes from uh, Matt Kirshen from Los Angeles, California. And, oh, wait, are uh, you a Patreon member? Is Matt Kirshen a Patreon oh, member? Uh, I'm going to check the files right now. <laughs> All right. You're gonna have to, like, have your rights I'll give you a hall pass for this one. But I, I just wanted to, I, I, am I right in thinking constellations, the, the stars are not necessarily anywhere near each other? Or are they? Yes. Okay, so they, they look. Short the, answer, yes. They So there is sort of, it, there isn't a sort of astrophysics relevance to constellations other than that helping to know where things are like uh because the two stars could be in completely different clusters that could that's, be... a, that's a great question right because i i yeah. think moya that would be a, a, a naive if you just approach this whole subject naively you would say this is a constellation it must be something scientifically relevant about this area of the sky right mm -hmm. i mean why wouldn't anyone think that if you don't spend a lot of time thinking about the three-dimensional nature of space, it is really easy to assume that this this tableau of pictures we see in our night sky is made up of stars that are all physically clustered together. But there is that third dimension of distance that we have to think about. So um, the stars might look close to each other in 2D, but they might be very distant from each other in that third dimension. Except for the Pleiades, which you mentioned, which is a cluster. That's an actual- It is a cluster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. I did a, a research project in grad school on identifying moving groups of stars uh, by their chemistry. And we, we looked at the Pleiades cluster. Um, right, so those... in, in, in rare cases, they are related, but that's not, those are the exceptions, right? Yes, most of the time they are. Yeah. Separate. So that question was from Matt Kirshen of Los Angeles. Is that correct? Yeah, and, and Matt, I'm sure yeah. Matt's very grateful for that answer. I'm going to quickly <laughs> squeeze in this quick question because you did mention the ancients being on on substances. And Gina Martin from North Carolina just hit said, "I just hit my THC pen, so bear with me." Uh, but Gina wants to know about dark matter and wonders if dark matter could actually be the matter that escapes from black holes. Uh, the question then oh, goes on for a little bit, but I'm just going to cut it short to there. Interesting. Well, let's hold yeah. that for uh, their break. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, segment three of Astrophysics and Folklore on Star Talk with our expert, Moya McTeer, when we come back. We're back. Star Talk, Cosmic Queries, Moya McTeer, knocking it out with uh, what we're, we're trying to find out how people think about the night sky and what the 
relevance of that is to science and culture with Matt Kirsch. And, and Moya, what, where, what, where do we find you on social media? I've made it easy for you because I know my name isn't that easy to spell. Uh, I'm Go Astro Mo on everything. <laughs> Go Love Astro it. Mo. Whoa. Yes. <laughs> and, and, I picked it and in 2014, and I felt weird about it then, but now I kind of love it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's your it's your moniker. So uh, yeah. Moya, M-O-I-Y-A, and McTeer mm-hmm. is what it sounds like, but go Astro Mo. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so let's, let's keep this up. Oh, one thing I wanted to add to that previous uh, segment, uh, when, the, when the questioner commented on Orion and, and Mars, what was implicit there is that the star Betelgeuse which is Orion's mm. upper shoulder, is a red giant star. So you have the red hue of that star near the red hue of Mars. And so I think that's uh, contributed to the, to the uh, thrust of that question because there's yeah. a lot of action, red action, over in that part of the sky. Uh, and we all know that red means angry. Yeah, yeah blood. So yeah, red is blood. <laughs> if you see it in the sky, <laughs> then the gods are angry. Exactly, exactly. All right, Matt, keep them coming. Oh, so, so just before the break, Gina wanted to know about dark matter and whether it could actually be the matter that escapes from black holes. Oh, and then, yeah. And then the think? THC oh, yeah. started to kick in and the question continued. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow, Gina, I hope you're having a great time. And I'm going to tell you, we don't know what dark matter is either. As scientists, we have a lot of hypotheses. There are things we're trying to test out. But most of what we know about dark matter is how it behaves, not what it's made of. We know that dark matter is something that can interact with other stuff gravitationally, so it can you can feel this gravitational tug, but it doesn't interact with light, so you can't see it, uh, you can't touch it, you can't, uh, you know, if you shine a light through it, the light's just not going to know it's there. Um, is it stuff coming out of black holes? Probably, probably not. I'm gonna. I'll, I'll tell you now. That is not one of the leading hypotheses. Um, there, there were people several decades ago who thought maybe dark matter was just a bunch of little black holes because we can't see black holes, but they also interact with stuff gravitationally. So maybe uh, dark matter is just like a big clump of tiny little black holes. But it doesn't seem like that's likely. All right, plus, if they were coming out of black holes, the mass of a black hole would be dropping. And we don't yeah. really see that either. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And so that was a question that came out under the influence of THC? Yeah, but I think, wow, it, I think okay. it was pretty good. And also, just while we're talking about <laughs> black holes, Molly Jebson says, uh, who's an American university student living in Paris, says, I'm fascinated by white holes. And I recently read that a white, white hole singularity exists in the future and a black hole singularity exists in the past. What does that mean? Was THC involved in that question, too? <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. <laughs> it. It was not. Mo- Molly was a specific as to what was influencing that question. It could have just been the sheer wonder of the universe. <laughs> yes. That, that, yeah, that is TH, a force of THC unto itself, right? The mm-hmm. wonder, wonder of the universe. So, Moya, what do you know about white holes? I know very little about white holes. I was just going to say we're beyond my realm of expertise. Yeah, all I know here. is that it's like a mathematical opposite of a black hole. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. If a black hole, uh, you know, absorbs everything or brings everything in, not actively, it's not like a vacuum sucking. But uh, if that's what a black hole does, then a white hole should be the opposite. It, uh, it's where stuff comes out. Wait, Moya, someone once told me that there's no such thing as gravity. Earth sucks. And I believe that ever since. Are you saying, are you, are you trying to disavow me of this understanding of gravity? Come on now. I, I like to hold multiple truths in my head at the same time. So. All right. All hey, right. Matt, keep going. All right. Well, I'm going to combine these two questions. So I think this is getting back more onto home territory for both of you. So Marcus Gustafsson from Sweden uh, and also Dylan, who's a physics undergrad, between the two of them, ask, what are the methods used to map the size of the Milky Way? And where we are, lo- where are we located within it? And also, Dylan, who's the physics undergrad, said, "I'm wondering how we map the Milky Way. How do we observe something if we're currently in it? Do we just assume our looks from other galaxies?" Wow. Yeah. Plus, Moya, every star we see in the night sky is in the Milky Way, right? Mm-hmm. So tell us tell, what's going on there. I mean, we ca- colloquially we say, "See that band of light? That's the Milky that's Way," the- as yeah, though that's something that. separate from the stars that are around us. So why don't you unpack that for everybody? Absolutely. Yeah, so one one thing that I bring up a lot in my new podcast, Pale Blue Pod, is that we are not separate from space. It's not that we're here on Earth and then there's the Milky Way out there. We are a part of the Milky Way. The Earth is a part of it. 
We are a part of it. Um, so I just wanted to get that out there first about, oh, mapping the Milky Way. That's something we've been trying to do for hundreds of years. Um, I do think it's really interesting that we only realized there were other galaxies out there a hundred years ago. Uh, the great debate in the 1920s was all about, uh, are we alone or are there other island universes? And it turns out there are. So that's recent. But we did know that well, we just, were just, in a collection. Uh, that was island universe used in the context of a galaxy. Of other galaxies, uh, right. yes. Not as a separate, not in the multiverse sense. Right. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. De they were not having a great debate about the multiverse theory <laughs> yes, <that's right>. <laughs> <laughs> in the 1920s. Um, but we did know long before that that we were in this collection of bright points of light. And so the earliest map of the Milky Way was done by the Herschel siblings, Caroline and William. And that was back in the 1600s where they, they made some very simplifying inaccurate assumptions that one, they could see all of the stars in the Milky Way. We now know that we can't, we actually can't see most of the stars in the Milky Way. Um, and that we were in the center of it. Like they, they assumed we were in the center of it. So what they did was, was look out at the night sky and map the bright points of light, um, assuming that they were all like the same size. And so they tried to figure out the distance to them uh, using their brightness because they were all the same size. Again, lots of very bad simplifying assumptions, but they came up with this map of the Milky Way that just looks awful. Uh, but I, I encourage you to look it up. That was the first attempt. These days, what we're doing is using uh, much stronger telescopes and much better assumptions about how things should be distributed throughout the Milky Way. We've made observations of other spiral galaxies, so we have an idea of what the rough shape should be. Um, but you're right, it is pretty hard to take a picture of a house when you're inside it. Like we don't, it's hard for us to get a full view of what the Milky Way looks like, but we have models, we have telescopes that can see through the dust. So we now have a better view of the center of the Milky Way. We know where we are in the Milky Way because we can see that there is more light in one direction than there is in the other. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a matter of meticulous mapping over time and trying to make sure our assumptions aren't as wild as they were in the 1600s. Is it as hard as an unborn child figuring out what its mother looks like? I think it's easier than that. Um, okay. <laughs> I do think, because there's, there's you need, like, no... need like remote mirrors, you know, to look outside, <laughs> to, you know. <laughs> yeah, because I, I think that they're, they're, like the baby, the unborn baby could learn about the distribution of organs, but it would have no idea what like the mother's face looked right, like. Right, right, okay. I, I feel like we have a pretty good understanding of what the Milky Way's face looks like um, because there's not much variation, really. When you, when you boil it down to the different body parts of a galaxy, there's, there's not that much diversity. So we, we have a pretty good idea. Right, cool. All right, Matt, keep it coming. All right. Well, we have. I have a question. We have a question and, and about. Plus, I mean, depending on how many questions you have, I might want to go into lightning mode, and this yeah. will put Moya to the test. See if she yes. does. We've she have got... sound bites in her. This is like the great I... test of the educator. All right. Well, All right. I will, I, yeah. If we do, if we go into lightning mode, I'm I'm gonna have to do some editing on some of these questions because this is a this is a subject that people have gone deep on with the questions. People have really like. People have written like mini essays and uh, they babbled on and on about it. Okay. okay. Well, they're very excited about it, but uh, mm -hmm. so. The artist formerly known as James Smith from Indianapolis, I remember that name from previous episodes, says, Dr. Moya, astrology astrology is a very popular subject these days. I think it's, I think it's fair to say there is a popular subject all days. It, uh, but James says, do people believe that the stars are influencing their lives because of tradition, or do you think it's because they have something to blame their rational behaviors or even their great luck on? Who are the first to see the stars for more than the, what they truly are? I, I'd actually say for, for less I'd than they truly that. are as well. But. I love that question. Yes, and, and Moya, yes. wouldn't modern astrology be considered folklore in your by your definitions? I do. I do consider it folklore. Uh, we are creating folklore and mythology in the modern day. Uh, I think both of those reasons resonate with a lot of astrology practitioners, uh, people who follow it. Um, they need something to reason. They have been told that the stars dictate events in their lives. And I think it's very comforting for them. Uh, I think a lot of people use it as a way to feel connected to the universe larger than ourselves. Okay. So as a scientist, I, I, it's, I don't, I don't follow it. I don't believe in it. As a folklorist, I love looking back at ancient astrology to see the real and practical ways that humans 
knew the sky did dictate their lives. Um, uh, okay, so you would you would distinguish then astrologers of 500 years ago who didn't know any better, and that was mm-hmm. like their best way to account for their reality versus today, yeah. where we actually do know better, yet they're still mm-hmm. doing it. Yes, I would distinguish them. Um, I think that ancient astrology was extremely practical. Um, It had to do with when were you planting your crops? When were you moving because of seasonal flooding and stuff like that? Um, There were also people who read information from the sky that was less practical. Um, I, I think it's pretty agreed upon by folklorists now that ancient Babylonians were among the first to not just track the motion of stuff in the sky, but to assign divine meaning to it, by which I mean they had priests, they had astrologer priests who spent their lives learning how stuff in the sky moved because that was their way of interpreting the will of their gods. Um, and, And if there was an eclipse or something, they wouldn't go to war. Or if there if there was some alignment of planets of these wandering stars in the sky, then that would tell them how they how they needed to make, I don't know, government decisions in that time. Matt, you think um, that'd be a badass business card? Uh, astrologer, yeah. priest, and astrophysicist. That's that, you know, you're in charge of everything at that point. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of the business card I have. Uh, like people assume that because I studied the universe and because I studied folklore that I just <laughs> know how everything Yeah, works. you're just totally plugged into everything that yeah. matters. You're a scientist. Matt, we got to totally do lightning round. Here's the test. Go. Next question. I'm going to have to summarize this question because Edwin J. Roldan from Lancaster, Pennsylvania asked, what's your opinion on whether the next Mars mission should have life detection experiments on it? The Mars right, lander back, didn't contain a, a life detection test, but the Viking yeah, did. Yeah, back 45 years ago, there were some ambiguous results from the Viking landers. And so mm-hmm. uh, you, you think about exoplanets a lot, Moya. And if you think of Mars as a kind of an exoplanet, because we're looking and we might have life, except we can mm-hmm. also go there. Um, what do you think should be the priorities for, for the upcoming rovers? Yeah, I think that if there was kind of cloudy evidence before, let's try and clarify that evidence cloud. Um, As long as there aren't other instruments that would do better science, if it's not going to take up space, then yeah, let's put something on there that could um, try and detect more directly evidence of life. All right. I like that. Keep going. Matt. All right. I'm combining another couple of long questions, and I'm going to cut them uh, very short. Jim from Brooklyn and also James Bennett both asking about photons coming from stars. So uh, where James says, where does the energy of the photons go that have been redshifted due to the expansion of the universe? And Jim wants to know, um, if I stand out in the dark, I can see Vega shining brightly. Photons from Vega are hitting my retinas, but it's also true if I'm 10 feet from my left, 30 miles out to sea, or floating in interstellar space. Um, so all these photons are coming from the same star. So basically, how many of these photons are coming off? This seems a lot of photons and what's the deal with that and then he goes on to questions about dark energy and matter but i think you've answered that already there's a million photons <laughs> so many photons um one of my favorite things about light is that it's isotropic if you have a source of light photons are going to be coming off of it in all directions um so, and as they spread out they're still going to hit you even if you're 10 feet to the left or somewhere in the middle of the ocean it's all one of the millions of photons coming from that same star. Millions. <laughs> so, so many photons. Um, I feel like that is very separate from the first question you asked. So the first question was, what happens to the energy of the redshifted photons? Yeah. Um, I mean, so the the redshift of the universe only happens on very large scales. When we're talking about Vega or other stars within our own galaxy that we're seeing, they are not being redshifted away from us because of the expansion of the universe. Um, it's light from very distant galaxies that are being redshifted from the expansion of the universe. Neil, do you want to talk about where that energy goes? Oh, yeah, sure. There's still the same amount of energy. It's just now diluted. Okay, so the total (laughs) energy is still there, but it's now spread over a much larger volume. And so when you dilute the energy, the photon you detect, okay, has has lower energy, but the total energy of all of space remains the same from what had been put into it from the beginning. So it's so we have we think of energy density in the way you can think of matter density. Have some things are more dense than others. You know, a brick is denser than a than a balloon. So when you stretch out the universe, 
um, things just get less energy dense, but you're not losing any energy to some secret place. It's more diffuse. There you go. Uh, let's try one more. Yeah, I, I've saved this question for last. Uh, All right, Matt, go for it. So, uh, so Sandra Pagliani, who, who, like many of the questioners, says nice things about the podcast first, and then says, can you possibly explain Well, can't we hear the nice things? I want to hear the nice things. <laughs> oh, I, I need... <laughs> Just skip well, over that. I <laughs> thought we were in a lightning round. No, know? sorry. We Except for when people for say whole... nice things. Then we're oh, not in a lightning round. there's been a bunch of nice okay. things that various people have said. Sandra said, my favorite podcast of all time. Uh... That someone else who I, I can't remember now says thank you for all the science and the humor. They're, they're, people say Aww. people say lovely things about you. I uh, and and the show. Okay, I think they're doing that just to get their question answered. Say you say that, nice. You, you say maybe may true, but flattery works. Strategy. But <laughs> okay. Sandra Sandra says, could you possibly explain ghosts with physics? Since we can only perceive a specific range of the frequency spectrums when it comes to sound and light, we base our reality on these limitations. Could it be that what we call, quote, ghosts is residual energy from a past that is reaching us now, filtering into our current state of reality for a brief moment? Frequencies can create resonances at various harmonic intervals, so some of those frequencies can be picked up by humans, dot, 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 possibly? Wow. And, and, I... and Moya, ghosts, are, aren't they part of folklore? I mean, Ghosts I'm... are absolutely part of folklore. Yes. Look, I... <laughs> I have never learned anything in any of my science classes that told me ghosts couldn't exist. Oh, <laughs> oh, I see what you did there. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's mm -hmm. not a chapter why ghosts don't exist in anybody's. I've physics never read book. that textbook. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> um, but I, I like I said before, I like to hold two truths in my mind at the same time. I. I would love a world where ghosts and magic and these other folklore things exist. Uh, that's why I study them. I like to inhabit that world. Um, science can't explain most of that yet. So maybe one day there will be a textbook that says definitively whether or not ghosts exist because of physics. But until I read that, that book, science is real and also ghosts could happen. Oh, okay. All what about right. Frankenstein's? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is that is science. Yes. Uh, uh, what about the invisible <laughs> that is man? A mad what scientist. about yeah. vampires? What about Dracula? Uh, yeah, the list. I got a list ready to come into this. I, I love. Oh, this. I mean, they're Sp specifically calling it Frankenstein's just to annoy the many pedants who listen to this show. <laughs> yeah, to get away from the Frankenstein versus <laughs> Frankenstein's monster thing. Um, yeah, Frankenstein was just a human. He was just a scientist. So yeah, that exists. Yeah, Doctor Frankenstein. <laughs> yes. <science>. Yeah. <laughs> the doctor. Mm -hmm. There actually are some very interesting scientific ties to the origin of, of a lot of these folkloric figures. Um, I've been listening to some podcasts recently about uh, where the various myths about vampires came from, because there are, there are animals that suck blood, there are animals that will dig up graves, uh, there are reasons why you might find these stories very present um, throughout the world. Oh, uh, uh, with natural causes is what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, the, right. this is so I, I didn't get a chance to say this in the first segment, but the main interest I have in this intersection between science and folklore is that I really do believe they're two sides of the same coin. And that coin is something you can buy understanding of the universe with. People weren't just making up stories for the fun of it most of the time. Ancient humans were observing the world around them and coming up with explanations that fit into their worldview. And as we scientifically progressed and we gained tools and we had accumulated knowledge over thousands of years, then our worldview shifted uh, away from magic and, and gods and folklore. But the, there's still use, there's still value in the stories and the observations that people made. Mm, mm, mm. So what you should do is write a book of today's folklore <laughs> that <laughs> one day science will have something to say about. How about yeah. that? Yeah. What, I'd love that. Yeah, all the little superstitions. The little and maybe superstitions. in 100 years, yeah, people, the scientists will be like, oh, that's, that's why that happens. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll hope to get you back on this show before 100 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> when we have that. Moya, it's been a delight to finally meet you. All right, Matt, great to have you here. Oh, it's great to be here. You've been watching, possibly listening to Star Talk Cosmic Queries, our folklore edition. Loving it. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. Keep looking up.